And if you're hearing that music in the background, folks, and you were a kid like me that saw that great show from 1984 to 1993, Kids Incorporated, of course, that show changed so many of us when we were kids. It was a show that we loved. The music was great. And I'm proud to announce that the man behind that, the one who created this wonderful show, is with us today. He's done things like the video game Night Tracks, The Secret World of Alex Mack, Just Deal, Caitlin's Way, Class of 3000. He has produced so many great shows over the years, and he's going to tell us about a new one today as well. It is my honor to introduce to you the one and only Tom Lynch. And Tom, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor. Oh, thanks, Mike. I Every time I hear that song, I'm like... I just get happy. (laughs) How can you not get happy? Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny, Tom, and we're going to talk about it in a few minutes. But, you know, that show came out in 1984. And to me, for the fans who grew up with that show, it's still as popular today in 2023 as it was in 1984, which is just amazing to me that uh, we're approaching 40 years with that show. But um, first thing I wanted to ask you, Tom, is uh, how did the love for... TV. I mean, did you go to film school? How did that all start for you? Oh, no, it came in a really uh, different way. I was uh, literally, I was an 18 year old man. I was a gardener. I just got out of high school and I had a little truck is how I made my living, my my money. I was still living at home at the time. And uh, I wasn't really going to make it in college. It didn't feel right to me. And uh, I thought, what do I want in life? Well, I want to make a lot of money. I want to meet a lot of girls. And I want to travel the world. These were three things. I came from pretty humble beginnings. I was one of eight kids from a single mother. So we're pretty humble beginnings. So these were like, there was just fantasy to me. And uh, after I decided that was going to be my path, the next day I met a young lady who soon became my wife. And we've been together for the last 50 years. <laughs> so a lot of girls went out the window. I then, uh, where I grew up in Los Angeles, an area called West Hollywood, uh, there was a, a street called Doheny, which was the border to Beverly Hills. And in Beverly Hills, from the Beverly Hillbillies, I, that's where all the rich people lived. And something in my head said, all the rich people, they make movies. That's what they do. And that was really my drive. And I just started this journey to try to get hired anywhere I could get hired. I went to every studio, knocked at every security gate, wandered around. And when I uh, somebody whose house I was a gardener at, was a stage manager at this event that was happening at the Santa Monica Civic, which is an outskirts of LA. And they said, look, you can get in. I'd never even seen a television show tape. I had no idea what it was. And they said, you can go, I'll put your name on a list. You can go watch us do what you want to do. I said, okay, great. I go down there, the security guard, I walk up there all puffy and like, Hey, I'm Tom Lynch. I'm on the list. And they go, no, you know, you're not next. And, and I walked away and I did something that, has been indicative of everything I've done in my life. I was like, I'm not going to walk away from this. So I went around the corner and there are these boxes on this trash can. I picked up the boxes. I walked by the same security guard and said, I have a delivery for them and just kept walking and they didn't stop me. And as I walked in, they have a thing, what they call the artist alleyway, which I'm walking down. And as it opens up, there's lights, there's cameras, there's dancers, there's Elton John, there's Diana Ross. I'm going, I don't know what this is, but I'm not leaving it. Yeah. And I saw a little man there named Patrick who was moving, dragging trash cans full of beers like they used to put into the dresser, into the trailers for the artists. And I walked up, I said, I work for you. And I just went to work. Nobody even knew I was there. I just went to work and followed him around. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a pretty funny story. And um, so, you know, what what happened after that day? I mean, uh, well, how, did, how did it evolve for you? I, I was totally amazed by the process, by it just struck me. I was there for three days, rehearsals and lights, and everybody looked so important and so focused on their individual jobs. And I saw um, that there was a, what they call a cue card holder under the camera in those days. They have cue cards, big cards with writing on it, and the, the stars would read their intros and outros to it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Someone wrote that, and they say it, and it goes out to the world. I'm like, you know, when you're one of eight kids, you're never heard. I'm thinking, wow, this is a way to get heard. Yeah. And so after three days, I went down again and the place was empty and everybody was pulling out. And I was like, wow, what happened? They go, well, the show's over. And uh, I saw on what they called a contact sheet, the crew list, uh, Don Kirshner Entertainment. The address was on Sunset Boulevard. 
And I said, well, I'm going there. And I went to that office and I literally went there every day for three months saying at 9 a.m. I'd be there. Do you have a job for me? And they said, no. I said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And I kept going. I had no other way in. And finally they said, okay, we'll hire you. You'll be a runner for $75 a week. Like, okay. And that's what I started with. I was, I was their office boy, messenger, runner guy. And you know, it's amazing, Tom, because uh, again, you said you didn't go to film school or anything. You felt college wasn't for you. A lot of times, you know, it doesn't really happen for producers that way. I mean, usually you go to some type of school, you learn about production, whatever it might be. So, I mean, just taking that chance that day and showing up and, you know, taking the garbage out, whatever you did. I mean, you never know when you do something that you're willing to sacrifice how big it could turn up for you down the road. Yeah, I'm a great believer in that. I've always had a plan. Even back then, my plan was I got to get a job in this business because I, it's going to it pay. It looks like it pays good. But my plan never works out. But the fact that I have some kind of plan, I'm willing to go and to do those things. Something else opens up. I mean, this man, Don Kirshner, gave me a job and I spent seven years there. Something that young filmmakers today don't have. Seven years, I went from being the office boy to being the producer and running part of his music publishing and his other things and going to New York and all that. We, we, they had episode orders of 26 episodes. They were up, so you're working for nine months there. And then the other three months, I'd get freelance work on game shows or whatever I was doing. But one of the great problems in our industry today is the strike is illustrating is that there's no apprenticeships. And I had one of the greatest apprenticeships ever from you know, a rock and roll hall of fame guy, Don Kirshner. And I was uh, forever indebted to him. Yeah. And I mean, he's been a big, big part of music over the years, which yeah. you, you know very well. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing though, Tom is like, the other thing is you got to give him a lot of credit in the sense that he was willing to work with you, help you out. And I mean, that's what, that's what you hope everybody who's been in the position that you were in when they get, you know, I don't want to say famous, but they get big, they will return the favor and do it for somebody else who's trying to make it big, you know, make, get a break. Well, I think it's necessary for any of us that have had success in order to have continued success. We have to, in my opinion, we have to get new minds under us and raise them up. I mean, the only thing success has that's different now than 40 years ago or 50 years ago when I started is I have access to the whatever the so-called seats of power are. I can call the president of a network or the president of Netflix or the president. I can call these people. That doesn't mean I'm the best idea. There's some guy or woman under me who's got a really great idea. She can't make that call. I was just talking to somebody today, Deja Harrell, who is a a writer, a young writer, a young diverse writer. And uh, she's working with my son, Ryan Lynch on a script. And I hope they they have a great story and I'm going to provide the access for them. I'll make the call on their behalf. So I, I think it's incumbent on us or else, you know, I still write a lot of my own shows and still do that, but uh, it, there's real joy in seeing other people become successful. And I think it keeps me relevant. Selfish. Right. <laughs> exactly. So let me ask you this Tom. I mean, you know, a lot of times I think people don't realize what goes into producing a show, a film, whatever it might be, because it's not just, you know, behind the camera and you're hitting you record and all that stuff. I mean, there's a budget you got to deal with, you know, making sure that uh, you find the right people for the parts you want them to play and stuff like that. So what did you feel in the beginning for you when you were learning how to do this was the most challenging? Um, I didn't feel it was challenging. I felt it was like running away with a circus. <laughs> I felt, man, this is awesome. There's free breakfast. You show up on a soundstage. There's donuts and stuff. I, I tell people I only worked in showbiz because of the free lunch. You know, they cater lunch. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think to me that the toughest thing was understanding, and I didn't learn this for years, the understanding the needs of the artists matching the needs of the buyer, the platform. Those are really two things that you have to bring together. Um I'm going to quote a, a person I admire very much. Brian Grazier is a very famous producer. And I asked him that question. I said, what makes a great producer? Because I see myself as a writer producer. I create a lot of my stuff and then, uh, and then I go produce it myself. But what Brian said is that he manages the creative and the financial to, the, to, the, to success. I'm paraphrasing him, but I thought, yeah, that's the job. 
Um, more specifically, the hardest part is to come up with an idea that somebody is willing to spend a lot of money, resources, and time on. That's right. you got to be two years ahead. You got to be. Uh, they have to have a belief in you that you can actually deliver on what you're saying. There has to be a time in the marketplace that this will fit. You know, we are we are trying to. I wrote a, a show about with a, a woman named Shadi Petoski. Uh, a trans about a trans kid and the normalizing of it. And I don't know if we were too early for it. We had an HBO max and then HBO shut everything down, but we'll be taking that out again once the writer strike is over. And I think it's a valid show, but you're always looking at what is going to work with the audience. You're not so much look at what's what with the buyer, because oftentimes the individual producer has more in tune to what the, uh, what this particular project, not with the whole, world is watching but how his or her particular project will fit in a year from now in the marketplace so right and one of the things that really um amazes me uh tom is how many people you see who were actors and you know i look at rob reiner and ron howard two guys as examples these guys were on successful tv shows ron howard was on two successful tv shows right. rob reiner was tremendous on all in the family and really, other than a few cameo appearances, they've pretty much been behind the camera for most of their career. I mean, they right. I, it shows you that a lot of people really love the behind the scenes aspect of TV because these guys could have acted in anything and they chose to direct, write, produce. They yeah. enjoyed that much more. Well, I think I think in the case of Rob Reiner and. Um, um, oh, my Ron. God. Yeah, Ron Howard, I just blanked on him. Um, I think in the case of those two, you have to start with they're extraordinarily gifted individuals. Yeah. Now, Ron worked really hard learning about the camera, even in, in his writings and what I've read about him, looking behind the camera when he was a little kid doing, you know, Andy Griffith, Andy Mayberry. Then at Happy Days, I think he might have actually directed. He showed an interest in it. And I think the same with Rob. They were curious people. You know, Rob Reiner's father, started television. Carl Reiner arguably is one of the, the found, founders of television and certainly of television comedy, no doubt about it, but doing those show shows and all the Dick Van Dyke show and everything. So I think that they both had the ability to be around it and go, oh, there's a different world out there from a very young age. You know, they saw, and I, I also have heard from actors, not them, but I've heard from actors that, you know, with an actor, you have to go find your job every day. Someone has to approve you. If you're a writer or a director, you can at least have a little bit more control over what you're going to do next or planning what your next job is. So. So, Tom, I think um, the the first big break and I might be wrong, but I think this was the first big break for you was around 76. I think you were a co-producer of the variety show, The Jacksons, which if anybody followed the Jackson five, they know how popular that group was. So, I mean, that's a pretty big break for you to get, you know, and a great way to kind of get your you know, career to where you want to be. Okay. That has its own story to it because I wasn't a co-producer. I was like an a associate something on it. I don't even know if I was an associate producer on it, but what happened on that, one of the producers, and this shows how whatever job you're on, you don't know how that's going to get you your next job. So the producers of uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert were David Yarnell and Bonnie Burns, these two producers who were basically the people I worked for. I didn't really work for Don until years later, although he was the boss, he was in New York and they, these were the LA people. And I think it was Bonnie Burns had a job at um, to produce, to be the line producer for the Jackson 5 series, uh, which they were coming out and doing. And since she had worked on the rock music award show and rock concert, she said, Tommy, you know, come work. You, and that's all you're doing all day is looking for your next job. Anyone says, I have a job, you say yes. I've never said no to a job in my life. I just love it. And the curious thing that happened there, and again, this is how my plans and strategy don't work out. I was happy to go work on my next show. But since I was at that time, I think 18 or 19, and Michael, I think, was 16 at the time, 15 or 16, I was the youngest person there. And I had known Michael's brothers through playing basketball at the park it's a weird thing when they moved out from indiana at this park we grew up in but so i became the one assigned to michael to be there first and have breakfast have his breakfast ready before he went to school because as a minor you have to go to school and michael and i became friends and uh 
it was over the years as I did Kids Incorporated. His songs were used in that only because of Michael. He said it was okay. Night yeah. Tracks, we would did we launched the Bad Tour. We did the big promotion of the Bad Tour on our video show because Michael was there. Michael was a, you know, he was he and I had a connection. And we didn't hang out, but we would talk to each other once every couple of years. He'd call and just say, hey, what are you doing? Da, 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 that kind of thing. So as a, lo as a lowly production assistant, I met the greatest entertainer of the 20th century, certainly. And let me ask you, Tom, I mean, he had already been big with the Jackson 5. I mean, he was the voice of the Jackson 5, talented singer. But, but you never know how somebody's going to sound when their voice changes, they get older. Yep. Did you, could you tell by producing this variety show and just listening to his music that he was going to be even bigger than he already was. I have never seen before or since somebody that had such talent, such knowledge, such ability, like on stage, watching him rehearse with the choreographers, he'd go, no. And he always spoke softly. No, let's do this or this or this. And it was always right. He was gifted, just unbelievably gifted. Um, yeah, you knew that guy was going to be special and great. And there's also an interesting thing there, though, at that time, is that artists weren't as big as they are now. There was He instrumented, I think, the change of artists being controlled by managers, record labels, et cetera, et cetera. And there's always that conflict. And Michael kind of transcended that. He was so big. Everybody's like, yeah, we're just going to let him go do what I, he does. You know, and he was great at it. And he, he chose... Him and Quincy Jones had that great relationship with his records and they made those records. Um, I think Michael was a generation artist. You know, I, I don't know anybody today. I, I Lady Gaga comes to mind, but I don't know who else is like on that that kind of level that can do all those things like him. But you knew right away this guy that he was special and he was gonna go do whatever he needed to do and wanted to do. And let's face it, Tom, he's really the reason MTV took off like it did. He made those great videos. I mean, obviously Thriller, but look at every video he did. Billy Jean beat it. Right. You yeah. know, even with Paul McCarthy when he co, you know, wrote yeah. a few songs with Paul. I mean, he, the yeah. guy was just magic when he went out there. And he loved it. He loved the uh, the video medium because he didn't have to... And now I'm just imagining this, but my thought is that he didn't have to go out all the time to go promote all his records. He could do a video and the entire world can see it. He understood the global reach of it all. We were at the, uh, I actually was on the Beat It set when uh, Bob Giraldi was doing it. I snuck down there to watch him shoot it. And that was the one with the lit floors and all that. And Bob Giraldi was a, was a uh, commercial director. And I was like, wow, what's this guy? I was always going on to places to see what other people were doing, not stealing ideas. But I did not know because of not having college. I did not know how everybody worked. And I had no pattern for how I was going to work. So I kind of took pieces of every. What I just looked with enthusiasm at what other people did. And it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Uh, well, it was cool. I think he was responsible. He certainly boosted MTV. But MTV, the history of MTV is before um, and it's why, again, Michael called me up at one point before MTV had Michael on. They had no black. They had no black artists. They had no black artists. It was rock and roll. They didn't have it. I started the music video show Night Tracks. And I think MTV was only on the eastern states. And I went on Ted Superstation with my video show Night Tracks. And I was putting in many hip hip hop was a big thing for me. I think I put on the first NWA songs. Um, I just I knew that it was twofold. One was. I love the culture of hip hop, the, the music, the sound of it. And all the white artists had deals where exclusive 90 day deals or 60 day deals with MTV. So I couldn't get them. So this confluence of things created the playlist for night tracks. And uh, we, we, I don't think anybody consciously would know this, but I hold it in my thoughts that because we had success with night tracks, they started thinking, wait a minute, we better start playing all artists. <laughs> and certainly there was nothing that, like, I mean, Beat It, Billy Jean, Smooth Criminal. You look at those videos, it's Scream bad. is still yeah. the most expensive music video ever made. It was like seven or eight million at that time. It's just crazy. And then, yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Oh, no, I did a pilot uh, way, I think, before this time. I did a pilot to continue with Michael where it was called uh, Stepping Out. Smokey Robinson hosted it. It was my first pilot I funded myself. Smokey Robinson was hosting it. Cool and the Gang had the number one record. Yeah. 
and uh, Kim Carnes was on it, and it was kind of a countdown of soul at that time called soul or R and B music, right? And uh, I think I got, I think I'm remembering this right. I wanted Janet Jackson, who had a, she was 15 or 16 at the time. She was a young girl, 13, and she was starting her career. And I wanted to get her, or somebody called me to use her. And Michael and I ended up talking on the phone. And I just said, man, she's really good. She goes, yeah, Tommy, she's really good. She's going to last. <laughs> and we had her on it. And the pilot never went to series. It was one of my learning curve where I lost all my money on that. and went, uh-oh. <laughs> that I didn't know how to sell it. I did not know. I had learned the manufacturing part of a show and the creative part of a show. I didn't know how to sell the show. And so that's something I had to go learn again. So. And think about this, Tom. Um, there was no YouTube, no Pandora. So people, Night Tracks in a lot of ways was a way for people to hear songs that they may not always hear all the time. Because let's face it, I mean, I'll just use as an example what's love got to do with it with Tina Turner. You had to hope the radio stations were going to play it yep. in the car or when you're listening to your radio. But you couldn't tell when they were going to play it. Night Tracks gave you that second mm -hmm. option where... You could watch a bunch of the hits you really like. So it was a very creative and innovative thing that you and your team came up with. Oh, thank you. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was, I had Ted Turner was, it was his superstation. And we met with his people. Bob Wessler was the president. And we met with his people and said, I said, we can take your midnight to 6 a.m. and make it work better. This is just like me walking in with the boxes. They don't know who I am. And I'm telling them stuff I'm not too sure of. I'm, it could work, but we can improve your rating. At that time, the rating, if you had a hashtag, it was less than a 0. 0.5. And uh, I said, I'll get you out of hashtags. And they said, blah, 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 blah. And then, yeah, it it did. It worked for them. And uh, that ran, I don't know how long Night Tracks ran. Was it like 10, 12 years? It was a long time. Yeah. And, that, you know, glad you brought Turner up because I think sometimes he gets looked at more for, you know, the Atlanta Braves and, right. you know, CNN, TNT. But, that TBS superstation was one of the best ever. What was really cool about it too is he did everything at six oh five to seven oh five. Like it was never six o'clock to seven o'clock a show. Yeah. Everything was oh five, and he put a lot of good TV on TBS. A lot, like you know, they even put the new Leave It to Beaver on that channel. I mean, yeah. he had different things that people could watch, and it was a good, it was a nice channel to have, you know, because. Yeah. When I was a kid, it was Channel 11. That was one of the, you right. know, syndication stations. But TBS was really something cool. He, Ted was the founding father of cable. I mean, he understood whatever he did. And I'm not sure the technicality of it, but he had the local station in Atlanta. And then he figured out how to get it to a satellite and make it a super station. It went all out. And that was a game changer. That was, and he loved television. He loved the medium. He loved, um, he loved also being uh, counter to what the, the networks in New York, you know, they were all run out of New York at that time. And Ted would come in and just play this role of, you know, the country boy. And Ted was smart as they come, but he played the country boy. And these guys would all be in their Armani suits or back then it was Brooke Brothers suits. And they'd be looking kind of down on him. And he won before he even walked in the room with those guys. <laughs> he, yeah. was, he was a great, great man to, to, just had to cross paths with is I, I think is all I could say about my relationship with him, but it was great. It was great. Right. Definitely. So Tom, I think it was around 1983. You came up with a pilot and it was called kids incorporated the beginning. And just tell me number one, what gave you the idea to do a show like kids incorporated? I mean, I know fame had come out a couple of years earlier, but mm -hmm. your show was completely different from fame. So I wouldn't say it was similar other than there were dance numbers, but right. it was definitely, you know, that was what we were seeing more in the eighties was uh, yeah. the different shows that involved music. How, what was the inspiration for kids incorporated? For I think it would have been my family was the inspiration of it. Because if you notice in the show, I don't think we ever saw in the 150 episodes, we ever, ever saw a parent. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not never sure the kids' did. parents. Yeah, right. There'd be an adult would come through, but never a parent. Yeah. And I think that was an homage subconsciously at the time to me and my brothers and sisters. You know, there was eight of us and my mother was working three jobs. So it wasn't that we were parentless, but 
we had to work out our own things and our own answers and our own problems together. I mean, we or, or we just had to figure it out ourselves. And I wanted the show to be, there was a couple of things that were going on at the time. One was uh, I was directing music videos at the time and doing night tracks and doing, I think I was doing night tracks and doing these work. I don't know. I wasn't doing night tracks at the time. I was directing music videos and doing variety shows, like big music variety shows. And my wife had our first son, had Thomas. And uh, I got sent home from the hospital because I thought I'd stay there. But no, you don't. She's a rest. I go home. And I was so jacked up on adrenaline. And I thought a very weird adult thing. I'm like, I can't have my kid around rock and roll. I think I was in the middle of producing a Van Halen video or something. I'm like, I can't do this. And so I thought, <laughs> what if MTV meant Little Rascal? So I think I made it for my kid. <laughs> I think that was probably it. <laughs> well, you know, what I remember, too, you talk about your kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. When you would do um, certain episodes, I remember it would say uh, some the Lynch family and a cast of thousands. You would put that in the credits sometimes. <laughs> so you do those little unique things. But what was really remarkable is um, if you remember, well, of course you remember, is originally – you did not have Rasan Patterson being on the show. He was not in the pilot and you had to kind of splice him in right right at the end. But really, I mean, you know, nobody knew if it would take off or anything. Um, did you have a good feeling after you shot that pilot that No, I was I was petrified. I'll tell you why. MGM had the rights to the show. They came to me, they said, We have this video of these kids singing songs. I had been doing all this music stuff. We think we want to go to series. What would you do? So I looked at this video that they had and it was, um, it was, you know, uh, Martika, I think was in it. Jerry was in it. Uh, Stacy was, was in it. And I said, uh-huh. I said, no, this isn't the show I'm going to do. I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and you got to remember I'm 26 or 27 at this time or something. I mean, I, who says no? I'm like, this isn't what the show should be. I had been, when I was in New York working for Kirshner, I had seen a lot of Broadway shows, uh, which coming from LA, you have no idea what a Broadway show is. And as you stated, with no YouTube or social media, you really had no idea what a Broadway show was. And I remember going to see earlier 42nd Street, which was like story, music advancing story, more story, more music. And I went, that's the show I want to do. So I based that off of the form of a uh, loosely off the form of a Broadway musical. And that's what made that show successful because people fell in love with the characters. They just didn't see them as performing artists. They saw them as characters. And then they had this other magical element that they could perform and sing well, but they had one of the great things about kids Inc is that every story in that show was a story that came from somebody's real life. When we yeah. sit in the writer's room and go, Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, mine were always like the magic toy shop, which those ones I wrote, because to me, I don't know, from birth, I always saw life as a little more magical, a little wondering what if, what if. And uh, then some of the other ones more serious. Um, I think we did one on we got in such trouble for it. Oh, my God. We did one where the kid showed up. One of the kids showed up with a black eye and it was about parental abuse. Yeah, and I was going to ask kid. you about that because yeah. at the end of that episode, the kid is walking with a guy by the name of Coach Lynch. Was that you? I mean, it didn't show his face, but was I, that you? I don't know if it was me or not, but it was certainly intended to be me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, that when we got Rasan into the show, there was a woman named Chip Fields who's, I think she's retired, but she had a great career as a director of sitcoms and her daughter is Kim Fields and um, um, then her, oh my gosh, Charlotte's daughter was going to kill me. But they, she came, someone said you got, she was an acting coach at that time. And I, someone said, I said, I need somebody diverse in this show. It's too white. It's too, it doesn't feel, I need somebody that's got some, that can bring a different tone to the show. And Someone said Chip Fields will know. So I called Chip up. We introduced ourselves to each other. I said, I got to find this kid. She says, okay, I know the kid. Like right away, she goes, I know the kid. I go, what do you mean you know the kid? His name's Rasan Patterson. I go, he goes, she goes, she's perfect for your show. He's perfect for this. Da, 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 da. He's gifted. I go, okay, great. Where is he? He's in Brooklyn. I go, <laughs> in Brooklyn. Okay, how can I see him? Well, again, there was no video access, whatever. Well, you're gonna have to fly him out here. I go, <laughs> Well, how do you know he's good? He goes, he's been singing in church. I've heard him sing. He's the guy. Okay. So we fly Rasan out. He sings. 
what did he say? I just, I want to say the greatest love. Whitney's the greatest love. Would well, that, that was when he did that in the second season. And he did it in the show, too. Yeah. I mean, you heard this kid saying, like, literally, he walked into the room. He was 10 or 11, a little guy, shy. You know, he just gets off a plane. He's never been around anything like this. I go, hi, how are you? Um, yeah, just sing anything. And we had a pianist in the room. The pianist just kind of playing. And this voice came out of this kid. I'm like, oh, my God. It was, it was, you know, when you see great talent, there's, there's, I've always said, there's no, there's no, there's nothing hard about recognizing great talent. You just got to keep looking for it. Yeah. Because you see that, you see Michael Jackson, you see Stacy, Stacy sang, and you're just, she sang as big then as she did in the Black Eyed Peas. She was fantastic. Oh yeah, she so, definitely was. And it's funny about Rasan too. Um, one of my favorite songs that he did, and I didn't at the time think he could sing it and make it sound as good as the original artist but the song every breath you take he was phenomenal oh, that yes yes that was fantastic you know just that like he i mean i like listening to that version a lot because i mean just the power he had in his voice and the way he let it out it was it was i mean that's a gifted singer right there he, he made it his own. Everything he sang became Rasan's song. And that's, he did fantastic. He did really well. And he, I ran into him a few years ago. I was at a nightclub uh, where we've seen some artists sing that we want to see. And he was there and it was just great. It's just very, very proud of my association with that show and the people in it. It was really lovely. So let me ask you this too, Tom. Most of the time during that run, you kind of occasionally like, you know, Martika was called Gloria, but right. Rasan was called Kid. But for the most part, you kept their original name. Yeah. yeah. Was that just did you just feel like, you know, you wanted them to be themselves more or less? Or? Yeah, I think it was probably I was walking that line. Do I want them the show to be their lives or do I want to create their lives for the show? And I don't even think I had the ability at that time to. uh formulate that thought but i know i rode that line because when they went into public and they did public appearances it was always nice to have them call i mean you know um jerry jerry how are you you know uh stacy uh martika gloria that was always gloria i'm martika and then she became a solo artist as martika and so i think that might have been something i could have i chose down the middle instead of doing one or the other but yeah. uh, if I had to do it again, I might just have them keep their real names. Right. And Tom, the first season was tremendous. I mean, I used to love getting up Sunday mornings to watch that show. It was usually on eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Um, yeah. And you could always watch it. But then, you know, as the season ends, you lose Jerry. And I said, to, you know, I was a young kid, but I'm like, I'm not going to watch this anymore because right. Jerry's not on the show. Um, you bring in a guy, by the, or a guy, a kid by the name of Ryan Lambert. And I'll tell you what, like, he, to me, just had the look of what a singer, a guitar player is. He really, the, the show never missed a beat when he came on it. And right. like, I'm sure you auditioned a ton of people. I mean, how do you just know when somebody is right for the part? Um, it, I, I'd like to say there's something you can do, but you just go, wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and there's a lot of people around me weighing in opinions and I've got to still, you know, you're responsible to a studio and whatever. I don't know if changing Jerry, I loved Ryan in the show and he did bring the show up another level. The ratings had a bump on it because he was like kind of a teen idly guy. But yeah. I don't know. Uh, my vision for the show was always to move the oldest out and to keep it all going so it could run eternally. I, I wanted that show to run 50 years. Um, and so that's why that happened. I don't know if it was correct. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about it, obviously, and a lot of uh, hurt feelings. You know, the thing about dealing with young actors, no matter who they are, they don't understand all the dynamics and nor should they, you know, nor should they. I mean, it's, you know, Jerry was seminal to the success of the show. And then after all that success, because we broke out that first year, people thought, People thought the show wasn't going to work. I literally, in those days, they had what they called three quarter inch videotapes, you know, those old big videotapes. Yeah. I had to fly around to most of the stations around the country to get them to commit to the show. There wow. was, and I was in Los Angeles, KTLA was my last station, a gentleman named David Simon. And if I didn't get him, the show wasn't going to go. 
MGM was like, yeah, we can't sell it. You go sell it and, or we're going to pull the plug on. I'm like, Oh, so I go around the country. I get to KTLA and David Simon was the general manager of the station. And uh, I showed him the show and he, we talked a little bit and he said, okay, we'll take it. And that literally changed my life. But if he said, no, I don't know what I would have done. Right. So and it's, you know, it's interesting. Cause I always wondered why Jerry left. I thought maybe Jerry was just older and he felt like he needed to do something else, but it is interesting that, you know, it was more of a, like you said, you have to kind of like, you know, move on from them as they get older, right. and put the new cast of kids right. in. Um, you know, one of the funny stories I heard, you tell me if it's true or not. I heard you originally were going to call Ryan Eddie on the show, but Stacy kept referring to him as Ryan when you guys were doing the table reads. Is that true? I don't recall it, but it sounds like it's absolutely true because that would be me. And I went on to do a show calling a dog Eddie. So Eddie might have been in my want mind somewhere. But yeah, I think... Uh... I, I listened to the, if I did anything different than my contemporaries, I listened to what the cast was saying. I wouldn't always do what they asked, but I listened, I took it in. It was all, it, it wasn't in those days. Now it's much more um, equanimity between creators and the stars. But back then it was like, you just with a kid, just be there, be quiet, do what I tell you. Thank you. Go to school. You know, I, I would like to think that our kids on the show, that they felt that their voice was heard, you know, that they could say right. things. And it would be just like me to hear them her going Ryan Ryan and me to start going well that sounds better than Eddie so we'll do Ryan we'll do Ryan and, and Tom you know I was thinking about this too um you kind of brought it up a little bit you know saying that uh there's their kids so they don't always understand everything and I'm sure one of the most difficult things at times was getting these kids to get along with each other because when your kids like anything else you have days where you fight with each other because your kids they're still kids yeah. so you know you had to kind of make sure that you kept everybody you know where it's they were you yeah, know, getting in arguments and fights with each other because they are still young kids. It's the job. I might I I I very proud of 32 kid series, you would call them, that we were very the experiences were good for the kids. We were we went to great lengths to make sure that their school hours were respected. They did that to make sure that the environment around them was safe, that nobody was on that set, that we didn't know who was on that. Nobody would drift by there. We wouldn't allow that. Uh, we would throw baseball games and like Christmas parties and things of that nature. Not, I always understood my role, my role was not to become a parent, but it was to become certainly a, a, a safety. They had to be safe once they got into my hands. They had to be safe. And we, we worked hard at and designed patterns that are still used today about how school is handled, how uh, the sets are run, how um, people, you know, we do background checks on everybody that works on one of our kids shows. Right. Was, we're just, I do not want, you know, I've done shows that have failed and I've done shows that have been successful and that's just part of what you do. I would, I would be really, really devastated if anything damaging happened to one of our kids on the set. That would be bad. That would be bad. I would yeah. not. I would not like that. <laughs> right. You know, Tom, at the time, I'm sure, you know, as I don't want to say devastating, but it, you guys are probably a little depressed. I think after season two, they decided they weren't going to bring it back. But then Disney came in, they stepped up. And I'll tell you what, I just felt like that only hope uh, helped the show even more because Disney aired it three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, yeah. Friday. It was on, I think, two times each day. So, I mean, yeah. I think that sometimes you know goodbyes are a second chance the one you know crew right. camp, you guys and then you go to disney and it just really took off and it was a big winner for disney too. yeah it did it was a very successful show for them and i think it helped them get the channel because the channel was still on i think it was still regional there's some places yeah. it was finding and you had to pay for it back then too yeah huh? Pardon? You had to pay for Disney back then, too. You know, yeah. and, and cable was just starting to expand. And so it was still a weird world. And the Disney thing, we didn't look at it as rejection. We looked at it as salvation because the syndication market was changing. Cable was coming in. Um, people were more, not concerned with running kids programming. The networks had to run kids programming. That was all ad supported, like the He-Man animation and the toy company, Mattel stuff and Hasbro stuff. So we were this island out there that we were the only live action kids show that wasn't on PBS that was in the air for years. 
And so that was interesting. So we went to Disney. Um, it was uh, it was an interesting meeting. I will never forget this meeting. They call me over there. Part of the job is you're always called over to meet people you don't know. That people want to check you out. And we went to Disney and I'm there with my uh, producer, my partner, Gary Biller, who was my partner at the time. And uh, we sat down. There's probably 10 people in the room and they're all very serious and they're all kind of looking at us. And they're going, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking they're going, how did this guy get this show on the air here? And I had nothing to do with that. That was MGM's deal. They handled the distribution, right? So they, they did that. I think they took the quick guarantee check instead of wanting to go out on the road and sell it again. You know, they would have this, they didn't have to do any work. So they said, well, you're going to have to get approval on the episode, all the rules and this. And I pitched them out 13 episodes off the top of my head, right in that meeting. I got them all to say yes to it. And I said, we're out. <laughs> I wasn't, they didn't quite know what to do with me. And I have had a relationship with Disney for since then with various heads of it. That has been fraught with some of my biggest mistakes, some of my most wondrous moments. It has been a, uh, I don't want to say difficult journey, but it has been a colorful journey with the Disney channels and I. And now one of their top programming guys is Jonas Agins, a man that worked for me for 10 years, and he's now a top development executive there. So it, it all works out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Tom, one of the things that you could tell me if I'm wrong or not, but I really sensed when you were writing and producing this show is when you kind of knew it was going to be one of the cast members last year, you right. would give them that one episode to kind of like be their like goodbye gift to you, like where they have that moment in the episode. And I think of uh, Kids Incorporated rocking the new year. I really felt a lot of that was done for Martika because Absolutely. she was leaving. And then I look at um the episode with uh, Rasan where he, uh, he had two great episodes in his final season. One was when he reunites with his brother, a uh, right. great episode. And then we find out what his real name is. They had always known him as kid. So I always felt like when these guys were leaving the show, you were loyal to them in the sense that you appreciated what they brought to the show and you always gave them, you know, a great last season for them. Well, well, thank you. I, I don't know if I did that consciously. I know that I wanted them. See, I never looked that they ever worked for me. I looked that I worked for them. They, right. they, these, I mean, imagine to have that much talent to show up, to rehearse, to go to school, to be people asking for your autograph. It all sounds good for a day or two, but to do that over years, it's a lot. When, you're, when you reach celebrity status of some kind, it's a lot. So I always thought it was my job that I worked for them and – they returned it. They worked for me. They, they gave great work. They gave great work. They showed up. I can't remember any time. There were a lot of fightings because part of the fightings came from their, their natural age. There was a lot of crushes and yeah. that kind of stuff, but very innocent and very uh, chaste. But they would be, it would cause some heated things, doors slamming and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff was going on. So yeah. um, I would get a call. I'd be at my office writing away or doing whatever. And I get a call. Uh, so-and-so just slammed the door is not coming out okay because there was a rule on all my shows when a problem with a kid reached defcom 5 right which which level nobody call me i will deal with it i don't want anybody else dealing with that no one's telling them what to do right I will, and it's not that they didn't have to listen to their choreographer dorian grussman their directors gary halverson um to the other writers and producers but if it got really weird then I would get the call and I'd walk down the stage and go talk to them and it all worked out. And it all worked out. Yeah, it definitely did. Now was your, was your idea to have them do at least three or four seasons? Cause it seemed like that was the pattern. Um, Renee and uh, Rasan left after yeah. the fourth season. Martika left after the third season. And it was really, it wasn't strange to me. I was glad he was on, but the right. final season, right. That Ryan was on you would expect maybe Ryan to leave before Rasan and Renee, but he stayed on that one more year. Yep. So, I mean, was that it was what the you're... aging out thing? It was the yeah. aging out. That's what it was, is that it wasn't about who was doing well in the show. Cause I don't even think we had research on who was performing well or not. I wouldn't, right. I, I was never available to that. And I never looked at it. It wasn't as uh, schematic as today where you can tell the third lead in episode five did a, 0.5 increase on the rating you know it, we didn't have those matrices then metrics then but um 
I think that everybody moved out because they were the next one in age to move out. I think that's what it was or the next one to go. But that's right. kind of that was the pattern of it. And then I think um, and then there was Jennifer Love Hewitt. Yeah. The Jennifer era. <laughs> and you know what? I think what hurt Jennifer, not that it hurt her, but the show had to go on hiatus for like a year or thing, uh, for a year. And yeah. she, I, I feel like she would have got another season if yeah. you guys go on hiatus. But let me ask you this, Tom. Um, you know, two episodes that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed them all, but two that were really like, you know, some defining moments and great TV, not just the music aspect of it. I, I brought it up earlier about Rasan and and the character Kid reunites with his brother. And I could always remember him singing that True Colors song and he's crying. He's got tears coming down his face, which was just a very mu moving episode. And then my other favorite one was the episode, The Guitarist. That was about the boy Tommy who was in a wheelchair. And yeah. I just thought that speech that Ryan Lambert gave to, uh, I think Jade Calloway played uh, Tommy. Mm -hmm. The speech that Ryan gave to him about you can't go through life without hope. And he right. gave like such a powerful speech. I really like those episodes when the kids could almost be like adults and they're like, you know, giving you that pep talk or yeah. giving you that. So, I mean, what was like, I mean, that's tremendous writing. And that, I imagine you had a lot to do with that, correct? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because I, I broke every story. And if I didn't write the episode, it certainly went through my computer. Although a lot of talent worked on the show. Um, I think what it was, though, was that I gave the creative people on our series the the um, permission to be real. Right. That was it. Be real with this. These are real people. They're real kids. They're real stories. And I've always in my entire body of work, life is is dramatic. It's funny. It's silly. It's magical. All within the same half hour. It's everything. It's like I call it life in motion. There's no one thing, especially in my age group, it go, moves quickly. So it was really important for me that we portrayed before it became popular to be diverse and to show all kinds. We were doing that stuff. We, we were doing it because that's how I saw the world. I just saw the world as all a different collection of all kinds of people that are different, be it color, be it religion, be it physical ability. We're all different, but we're all part of this fabric. And the best place... It's why I've stayed in youth television because I, and it's no offense to, to the people that write the hour dramas. I don't really care uh, who gets caught at the end of a criminal drama. You know what I mean? I don't care. I know it's someone, the bad guy's going to get caught and it doesn't excite me. And that's just me. It doesn't mean that's no judgment on it. I like to see minds that are forming and shaping and looking at the world going to the future. And that's what I always thought working with kids television did for me. Right. So. I also like that. Um, again, you would always let this, especially the older staff, obviously you let Moosey direct a couple episodes. Uh, yeah. And I mean, that's just like a great job by like, again, you knew what it was like at one point to be Moose yep. where you're trying to start out and then yep. you're giving him the chance to be behind the camera and direct. And I mean, he did a good job for those couple episodes. Did a great job. Yeah. So, I mean, you always like that's what I always felt about you and your team of people is that you were very loyal to these cast members, the dancers, the singers, the, you know, the soda jerks. And I mean, <laughs> you like really like um, gave them the loyalty that they gave you. That's what I always look. Well, at. thank you. I, uh, I, you know, it's it's hard going to work every day doing this stuff. And it's hard to what I always say that a performer has to strip themselves of everything and stand out there raw. And if they want to choose something else. Yeah, I'll, I'm the first one to help them with it. And Moosey was was he Moosey had won a couple Emmys, I think, from uh, was it laughing or something? He was. Yeah. And Moosey had to work and Moosey played a very difficult role because he knew he was second to all the kids. Yeah. So he had to be as on fire for the few scenes he was in as these kids were all doing all these scenes. And it was, uh, he was a, just a gentleman. And still today, whenever I talk to him and run into him, he's just a gentleman. And I think he made himself a good career as a director. Didn't he go off to do some more sitcoms and stuff like oh, that? Yeah, yeah. He's done yeah. very well. So, I mean, yeah. you know, it comes full circle and then think about this time, just like the, the success a lot of these stars had after kids incorporated. I mean, Stacy obviously became big with the black uh, He's right. and everything. Martika was tremendous. Rasan, right. uh, Renee even was with 
in Wild, Wild Orchid. Orchid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan, Ryan had a band for a while too, and he's doing acting again. Which yeah, is Ryan cool. did Monster High. He did the, one of the first big movies that like that. He did that for Disney, I think. Yeah, yeah. Be good. And I mean, you like a lot of these guys really like. Um, you know, if somebody just saw you at a donut shop and they're talking about Fergie and you're not talking to them, but they're talking about Fergie, how they love her and this and that in the back of your mind, you could be like, you know what? She started on my little, you know, my kids show I had. (laughs) So, I mean, it's amazing to think what success a lot of these actors got. And I really attribute a lot of it to them doing kids incorporated because it prepared them how to sing, how to do numbers, stuff like that. And I think that's a credit again, like to you and your staff. I really do. I think they, they learned also a discipline because I did not harbor anybody screwing up. You can make mistakes as you're working, but you're not showing up late. You're not showing up unprepared. I would come and talk to them and they knew as my staff knew when I came down to see a kid, there was a problem. The staff, the kids knew when I came down to talk to them that I was not, we needed to improve something. And that was, and they were fine with it. You know, I never spoke to them anything other than as an equal. And I would say very carefully, you need to raise your game up if you want to keep the spot, because you, you, this, you are worthy of the spot. You've created the spot, but you need to honor that and you need to put everything into it. And they, they did, they did. They, uh, they all worked hard. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was, Mario Lopez was the one that just surprises me the most. Mario. I mean, that guy has the best smile on tele on, on yeah. and anywhere. Mario's smile is like, it should be on a flag. It's the greatest thing in the world. It's the best thing. And he, when he went from there to go do say by the bell, that was like, really, it was really interesting because I think kids Inc was still going on when say by the bell started. I actually think yes. Saved by the bell yeah. was, was NBC's answer. Save, to- Saved by the bell came out in 1989. So, yeah. So, so what happened was NBC wanted to start their own kid block and they obviously they want to do something that would compete with kids Inc. Cause we were doing well. Disney was getting good stuff on it. And Mario, he came and said he had that opportunity. And uh, I said, take it, take it. He goes, well, I want to stay here. I go, no, 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 no. This is part of this. Go, go, go do that. Go try something, you know? And Mario and I have remained friends the whole time too. It's an interesting thing with them. I say we're friends with all these, and it doesn't mean I talk to them often, but when they call, I, I pick up the phone. And when I call them, they pick up the phone. And it may be years, but it's really, I ran into Fergie. I hadn't seen Fergie forever. And I was at a party after um, Outcast had won like eight Grammys for the Love Below. So I was doing a project with Andre 3000. And he said, come to the Grammy party. I said, sure. So I'll go hang out. I go to the party and I'm just hanging out. And it's just, there's a thousand people. It's weird. And I'm walking down. I go, Stacy. She goes, Fergie, Tommy, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I went and saw her concert uh, when she was doing her solo tour. And she's, Nothing gives me more joy than to see that these young people have turned into these really good humans. I mean, you know, they all do their own charity work. They all take they, they all have interesting lives outside of what we see. And I really, really like that. I, I find uh, great pleasure in that. So, yeah. And I mean, like I said, it was a tremendous show. It really was. So let me ask you, I mean, what are some of the other shows that you did that you really enjoyed and you're very proud of? I mean, I'm sure you're proud of all of them, but, yeah. you know. I think a Caitlin play class of 3000. I yeah, mean. Here's how, here's how I break it down because people, I get guys that question, what's your favorite show? And my pat answer, which I'm tired of is always the next one. Cause it's the next one that I'm enthused with that I want to go do, but I've broken it down into decades. Kids incorporate obviously gave me everything and allowed me to go dream more. You know, that was the yeah. 80s show. The nineties, I believe it was probably, um, the Secret World of Alex Mack, which launched Nickelodeon and had a huge impact on it, and was the first time that there was a single camera show out. You know that uh, where it was more filmic, more cinematic. Um, the two thousands, it was Class of Three Thousand. Doing an animated series with Andre Three Thousand was he's the most pure artist I ever worked with. I mean, he's Michael Jackson level artist of of genius and creative. Um, I don't know what you'd call it, fulcrum or something. Is they're just different, and it in all the good ways. And that show, which I didn't realize, was totally diverse between Asian, Black, 
white, uh, Latin. And I didn't know that. We just kind of combined that because it was important to Andre to have Atlanta represented. I went and hung out in Atlanta and that's what it felt like to me. So, but it became a thing. And we were picked as one of the top black shows ever made. Like, yeah. That's cool, man. That was good. And then in the strange, in the 2010s, I want to call it Make It Pop. When I, when I did the Cape, I created a K-pop band. Yeah. And I, there was an interesting dilemma there because it could not be Kids Incorporated. If you notice in my shows, none of them duplicate the other. I, I really work hard not to take, I'm sure I take <coughs> lessons from everything, but I didn't want it to be, oh, it's Kids Inco Incorporated with a K-pop soundtrack. It wasn't that. They were off at boarding school. The issues were a little older. And that show hit the air we were renewed within seven days of when that thing aired. It just blew up. It just yeah. was huge. And then second season, the, the uh, airing pattern was changed and we didn't perform as well. We were 10% off in our ratings, which was still higher than anything else. And then I had to fight back to get, to try to get the third one. And we, we didn't get the third season, but I'm not done with that show. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's good. And now I think, and now that I'm in the twenties, I'm thinking this is our new show. I hope, you know, uh, I woke up a vampire, a 13 year old girl that wakes up one day and figures out she has these powers of, of a vampire and finds out that she was adopted and part of this mythology of half blended of half human and half mythic creature. They're called the blended. And at 13, they discover their power. And at 16, they have to make a choice. Am I going to be a mythic or am I going to be human? And when they make that choice, the other part of their life evaporates from their mind. So no matter what that choice, that means they have to give up something. So, uh, yeah, so that that comes on, I think, October 17th on um, Netflix. It comes and on. let me ask you, how many episodes will that will you air that season? Uh, I think we shot two seasons. And so I think two seasons of eight. So it's 16 episodes. So I'm not sure how they're going to air it. But uh, they tend to air like I'm sure they'll air the eight season, the eight episodes and then take a break and then do the second the second round. And uh, right. I've already written the spinoff. <laughs> so it, seems yeah. like, huh? it seems like to me, Tom, that like you you always have your next idea, even before the idea that you have is being aired. You're already working on that yeah. next. Like you're always thinking. And, you know, one thing about Netflix, Hulu. Prime Video, all these is, I mean, it's just like there are so many shows people could watch now. And right. it's not like you have to wait a week to watch what happened. When episode one ends on Netflix, you could watch episode two right away and then three. Right. So you could almost like watch the entire uh, first season, second season, whatever, in right. a matter of hours. Yeah, uh, you can. And I've done that with some shows. I've done that with... Um... Emily in Paris, the first season, was a show that I just loved. I just thought it was so beautiful. And a friend of mine who directed on Alex Mack, Peter Lauer, directed some episodes. And I called him up and I said, how did you make this look so good? What are the lenses like? I'm still doing, Mike, I'm still doing where when I see something interesting, I go sneak in and ask about it, right? I go, and he had this answer for me that's just, it was crazy. And Peter's a highly respected director, very intelligent, very successful. He said, Tommy, if I shot Paris at night on my iPhone, it would look as good as any camera. It just looks that good. I'm like, okay, note the light in Paris is beautiful. <laughs> but I, I loved, and I binged that one. And then there was one I binged, uh, I think Drop of God, which is about the wine business, which was yeah. like, oh my God, that was hypnotic that took me in. And uh, yeah, so I, there's shows that I, that I will binge. I will sit and watch them all. And I try not to make them hurt me because whenever a show's really good, I'm like, Oh, that hurts. <laughs> Even though I've never thought of the idea, I would never pitch the show. It's not, it's been better. There was a point in my career. Uh, there's a woman named uh, Gail Berman, who's a very famous producer and head of a studio and all that. And we were having lunch and she says to me, she goes, what would have happened if you did Buffy the vampire slayer? I go, well, I didn't. Joss did that. Joss Whedon did that. He says, no, but there was a point where Joss didn't know if he was going to do the series. He did the movie and you were, you, we made a deal with your agents for you were going to do the series. I go, I have no memory of that. She goes, where do you think your life would have been? I said, Gail, it wouldn't have been as good as Joss did. You know, I truly believe that creators have their, whatever that is, whatever 
allows me at a moment to go, I'm going to do a kid in a wheelchair and it's going to be a real kid in a wheelchair. It's not, I mean, the kid is really going to be in a wheelchair. I'm going to do a story about um, the magic toy shop where everything comes to life and that helps somebody. I'm going to do a story about a kid, an animated kid trying to find his way in Atlanta and he does it through music. I think that as creators, we, we can't manufacture. We know all the rules. We know where we have to operate. But that organic thing of creating a show, that really tells the stories that, for in my case, I need to tell. And I often say this to heal me. When I tell these stories, it take it makes me better. It just makes me better. And that's why that's why I keep doing it. I, um, I, I feel honored that people allow me still to do it, you know, that um, – there, there's that whole thing about ageism and Hollywood and all that. And I'm okay with that. You know, my time will come, but you know, uh, my son has kind of taken over our business and he's right. I, I was giving notes to him on a pilot he's doing. And uh, I mean, we haven't sold it. This is all of us writers are having pilots ready. So when the strike's over, we can go sell them again. Yeah. But I, um, but yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's given me a lot. Television has given me a lot more than I've given it. I, I it's just given me a life that's, wonderful and wonderful friends and wonderful conversations and a real uh, i'm just grateful to that kid that showed up at 18 and said he wanted to see the world check make money I, it's provided for my family i've been in a life beyond what i could imagine and meet a lot of girls that was a dumb idea i met the right girl <laughs> <laughs> yeah proof of that so you can't. so let me ask you tom um what i mean are you confident that um this new Netflix series is going to really like, you know, take off right away. I mean, people are really going to get into it. And could you see it going, you know, three to five seasons? Cause usually I, in Netflix, that's the, yeah. no, the I don't see it going three to five seasons on Netflix. What I do see is I have 19 other stories attached to that universe of characters that, that go off and do almost like the Marvel universe did that yeah. I see happening. And whether it happens with Netflix, if it's successful enough on Netflix, fine. I would love to do that. They were incredibly lovely to work with. They were my first show with Netflix and it was a great, great experience. Uh, but if not them, for whatever reason, I'll find some other home for it. You know, I'll put it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, Mike, I've never thought about the success of the show. I obviously want to be successful, but there's so many forces around it. I don't know. You just don't know. You know, it's uh, I know what my job is, is to deliver what I consider to be the highest of quality for the resources I have with a point of view that's unique to me or my company. That's my job. And if it works, I am ecstatic. And if it doesn't work, I blame everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my company. I blame the marketing, the this, the <laughs> So Tom, I feel like if, if you were going to do something like this, it would have happened already, but a lot of, you know, tv series do this they reboot their series have you ever thought about doing a kids incorporated in 2023 like an update we did. we did before the strike mgm and i came to an agreement and we took the show out we we developed it with another writer and uh it was a very good presentation and every buyer wanted to hear it and none of them bought it they just didn't buy it and that doesn't mean i'm done with it jerry yeah. sorrell just happenstance a week ago jerry sent me a note saying i have a great idea for kids incorporated where he would come back as the owner of it and would operate it and all that stuff and we do it again i said yeah and i i think i don't have the right idea for it that is the 21st century yet and that's what i need to find and i don't know what that is i thought it would be i thought i had it with this last one out it didn't bite but i also think we're in a change when we took it out, all of the platforms, this was just about a year ago we took it out, when all the platforms were starting to see they weren't making as much, the streamers, making as much as they thought, what business do they want to be in? And my, my belief and my hope is that once the writer strike and the actor strike is over, I won't even predict when I think that is, but once it's over, there's going to be, and during the strike, there's going to be a... Uh, a change in how television's bought, what those deal parameters are, what the needs of the different platforms are. And it's going to be a, a brand new up. It's going to be a whole new way to operate and sell. And in that we're going to get kids incorporated on again. 
because well, they're going to want programming that can travel internationally. They're going to want programming that has ancillary things like tour and albums and those things. They're going to want some brand identification, which people like you would take your any nieces, nephews, children you would have. You would certainly be there with it and you'd go yourself. So it's uh, it's definitely before I say goodbye to this world, I do want Kids Incorporated back on. <laughs> it would be a nice symmetry to my life, I think. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I was thinking about, Tom is i don't know if you've ever thought about it is doing a kids incorporated special with the past cast members like a reunion where Mm -hmm. you know say for instance example ryan lambert and fergie they they talk on the stage about the times they perform duets together and the three soda workers meet behind the table and they talk about they finally get to meet each other because they never had and then like the whole cast gets together i think kids incorporated fans from the eighties would really love something like that. Something you ever thought of. that's an interesting idea to do a stage presentation of the show and tour that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. You know, I, think it would be, it. I think it would be something really good, but Tom, I will say this. Uh, it's an honor to have had you on today. I have always wanted to meet you always wanted to talk to you because I'm going to tell you right now, that was a part of my childhood that'll last with me forever and all the other shows you've done over the years. And what you've really done is you, especially for kids, kids that watch your shows, kids that are in your shows is you have gave them a childhood that they'll always remember and look back about when they're like in their twenties or thirties talking to friends about when they were kids, they'll talk about those shows. And that's how it is. Like, I mean, I don't know how much you see on the internet, but kids incorporated to this day, is still talked about. There's a guy who does a great website called Kids Incorporated. Us, and I mean, people just constantly are talking about the show, talking about episodes, songs. So I mean, you have given them that show aired, like I said, almost 40 years ago, and people still talk affectionately about it. Uh, I am uh, honored to be part of that that alchemy that comes together, and I really appreciate your knowledge of the show. I mean, you remember things better than I do. <laughs> at this point, I say it's fantastic. Well, it's been really graceful talking about this. And uh, you, I, you know, when you sent me your interviews, I thought, oh, well, he really likes what he talks about. You know, it's not I get asked to do a lot of interviews and I don't do them because, you know, they, it's it just doesn't feel right. But you had this way of you like you like the stuff you're talking about. I'm like, I'm good with that. Then I'm go for that. That sounds good. So I, well, I appreciate that. I really do. But I do thank you for coming on. Um, I really hope this new series goes well. I'll be watching it. Now that you told me about it, I'm going to watch. And I, Mike, I'll tell you what, if I get that show up, get to me, because I'll have you come on and do the behind the scenes. You can interview the kids because you would be the perfect person to do it. How fun would that be? I mean, I would love that. So (laughs) I do appreciate that, but thank you again. And I might be well, thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you. And folks, of course, that was Tom Lynch for In the Spotlight. I'm Mike Canici saying good night, everyone.